Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can turn on the video. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We have um, a great presentation today, and we will start and just give it another minute or two. See if anybody else can join us. We're almost to one o'clock. Hello, I'm uh, Gary Shipman's assistant. I was just making sure, can y'all hear me? Absolutely, wonderful. Okay. Thanks so much okay. for joining in. I'm gonna put it on mute and go get him right now. Perfect, thank you. Hi, Tony, Lynn, Jennifer, uh, Brian. Uh, thanks for posting the um, agenda. The um, If you could make Jennifer a co-host, she's gonna share her screen with her PowerPoint. And I am going to hopefully be able to share also with a link for the PBS um, interview that was done uh, of Jennifer and her property. Um, and we'll include that as part of the meeting. Perfect. We, we've got Jennifer set as a co-host. Fabulous. Hi, Sabina. It's Jennifer. Can you hear me OK? Yes, perfect. Great. Great. One participant can share at a time. Here we have Brian shared screen. All right. Oops. All right, everybody, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Can you see my screen okay? Everybody see my screen? I can, yes. Okay, great. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, so welcome see, to I'm sorry, I see you. Oh, you only see me. Yeah, I don't know if that's because I'm a co-host now, but I can only see you. I don't know what everybody else is seeing. All right, can anybody see the PowerPoint? I can't see the PowerPoint, no. Okay. Hey, Mary, let me see. I can't see it either, um, Sabina. This is Debbie. Okay. Yeah, this is Gary. I can't see it either. All right. Let me... Share screen. Sorry, I can't see why it's not letting me share the screen. Brian, you have me as co-host too, or is it just Jennifer? You're, you're designated as well, Sabina. All right. Ta-da! All right, how's that? There you go. Got it. Yep. All right. I am going to try to move this. Do y'all see the pane in the window as well? The Zoom pane? I want to go to full screen to make it easier for everybody to see. There you go. Now do we see yeah, the screen? It is. Yeah. All right, PowerPoint. Welcome everyone um, to our uh, Citizens Advisory uh, Committee meeting. And I will jump right in. Uh, today, we're gonna have Jennifer McPeak um, as our guest speaker. And she's gonna be talking about living shorelines, which I'm super excited about because this is um, an opportunity that's available to many residents that live along the, um, the shorelines and also a great opportunity for citizens like yourself to share that knowledge. Uh, to learn about it. Um, the organization Chakahatchee Basin Alliance, some of you know it as CBA, did a fantastic job of some living shorelines at Liza Jackson uh, Park in Fort Walton. And so if you would like to see some of that live and up close, please drop by Liza Jackson to see that. Uh, it looks um, really amazing. Uh, I was out there last week 
uh, to look at it. So these are some really great information. We're also going to share a video um, that was PBS uh, put um, interviewed Jennifer uh, for their show and the Living Shoreline that was done. And she lives right there on the Choctahatchee Bay. And then we're going to have Tony uh, Janicki come in and talk um, about the uh, CCMP Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan that uh, some of you all have uh, reviewed, uh, sent back comments and uh, to the draft version that was emailed out. I emailed that out as a Dropbox. And for anybody that was unable to access it or something, please uh, pop me an email after this meeting and I'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, they have extended the uh, review deadline to the end of October. So we'd really appreciate if you could um, take a some time to read through those. Um, it's just the beginning parts of it. So there's just a few chapters. Um, so I'll let him talk more about that. And then I would like to talk, um, time permitting, about some trash cleanup events and your ideas on that. And then we will be having, uh, we have our photo contest. Um, and then I uh, wanted the, uh, the CAC Citizens Advisory Committee to uh, give their contribution in our December meeting. And if time allows, I'd like to talk a little bit about rain barrels and rain gardens and um, our future meeting dates. So I'm gonna just jump right in. Uh, that's my slide. Jennifer, uh, did you want me to start with the video and then? Um, no, I'll just, I'll let you know when I'm ready for you to play it. Perfect. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and do shared screen on your part, on your side. Okay. And so I just click share screen. Yep. All right. And you're gonna Pick which one it is. I'm going to stop my share. Okay. Um, oh, I have to pick my. Oh, here we are. Hey, look at that. All right. So you can see this now. Yep. Perfect. Oh, okay. Great. Um, hi, gang. My name is Jennifer McPeak. I live in Destin, Florida. Um, I am just your average Jolene, I guess you want to say. Um, I don't have any particular science background. Um, I'm, I currently just mooch off of my husband. Um, and I, my last pro major professional endeavor was in advertising. So when I start talking about living shorelines and truly coming from this, um, from a place of ignorance, and um, I just hope to take you on this journey with me. So that being said, let's get on it. Um, I just wanted to start with a really uh, top line overview of what a living shoreline is. Uh, what it is, is um, it's comprised, obviously you have to be on a body of water and these things tend to do best on bodies of water that are a little bit lower energy. So uh, we live on a bayou um, so it, it, it's perfect for this environment. It's also good on lakes or rivers. Um, it's got a number of different applications, but I'm gonna be speaking about them as we've experienced as homeowners on a bayou off the Choctaw Bay. So a living shoreline is comprised of native grasses that once established help to hold on to soil and sand. Um, additionally, it's it's common to have breakwaters installed about, when mine was done, it was about 10 feet out from the shoreline. And what they do is they disperse the wave energy before it comes in and hits the shore. They also provide a little bit of protection to the shoreline to give those grasses a chance to get established and develop a good healthy root system. Um, the cumulative effect is a reduction in erosion and in some instances, um, accretion of soil or sand. And what a lot of people don't know is that if you own a piece of property on the water and erosion eats parts of that property, you don't get to claim it back. You don't get to go to um, the city or state authority and say, hey, look at this survey we had done, we've lost, you know, two feet of land to, to wave action and erosion, and we want to dump a bunch of sand and reclaim that, they'd say, so sorry, hate it for you. Um, but if Mother Nature deposits some sand back on your shoreline, there's not much anybody can do about it. Um, the native grasses additionally can absorb nitrogen from agricultural and residential stormwater runoff. So 
when everybody is fertilizing their fields or their uh, nice lawns and that runs off into water bodies, a lot of times that will feed those harmful algal blooms um, that are, are toxic to the waters and even to, to people. Um, if you've suffered from a red tide, you'll know exactly what that is. Uh, they also can act as carbon sinks. They provide habitat for all kinds of marine species. Um, and as soil or sand accretes, it actually will build up the shoreline and can, can in that way protect and combat ocean rise. And finally, they're much cheaper than seawalls. But uh, as Sabina said, PBS NewsHour ended up coming down here and in other places along the Gulf Coast and they did a terrific little segment. So grab your popcorn and let's let the professionals explain it. Sabina, you're on. All right. I am hoping. I can probably navigate there. Do you want me to just give it a shot? Uh, let's see. Can you see it? N no, but here I can I can get us there. Do you want me to do it? Okay, sure. Okay, here we go. A masterpiece mystery. I don't wish to sound boastful, but I am the only female detective in London. She's a what? <sighs> this is not part of it, by the way. If you wish to have some kind of I'm future. not seeing a video. I'm just yeah, curious. I'm not seeing a video yet either. Uh, take. We are in competition. So my screen sharing is paused. You can have audio. Hold on one second. Let me try and see if I can screen share. You need to switch your screen. Can everyone see it? No. Nope. Oh, wait, resume share. Oh, you know what? And when I navigated away, it uh, made me stop the share. Okay, I'm gonna I... stop sharing, you go ahead. All right, let's try again. Sorry guys, I've been out of the office environment for about 18 years. Okay. I've got it playing on my screen and it says resume share, but when I do, it takes me out of the PBS app. All right, let me try on mine. Do I need to stop sharing? Um, I think so. Let's go ahead and have you stop sharing. Okay. Let go me ahead. try. Does everybody see this? Yes. I got it. Okay, all right. This is the intro. And then it's going to go straight to it. Sabina, can you make that full screen? Let me see. You can go up. There, see the two arrows in the corner on the bottom corner of the screen right there. Nope. Nope. Put your cursor over the speaker. Go up. There. See two corners. Uh -huh. there. Got it. Ta da. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah, we need the. Can everybody see that volume. okay? We can see it, but there's no volume. Yeah, we need the audio now. Sabina. Still no volume. Are you there, Sabina? Um, okay, I go can over, you go hover over the speaker icon and see if your volume's turned all the way down there. There, no, yeah. Yeah, it's turned all the way up. Where you, you were playing the volume, the sound through yours, right? Me? Um, Because we could hear it on your screen, but I could not. Okay. Uh, 
Turn it back over to me. This is our first time trying to do a link this way, so good experience for everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Don't know that there's a good way to test this out. Okay, have you turned back over to me? Yep, I've stopped my share screen, so go ahead. Okay. Crying out loud. All right. Zoom. Okay, so share screen, there we go. And then share when you pick it, now. try to pick the TV screen. Share. That's it. For 25 can years, consumer cellular. Yes, I can. Can you see? To help people yes. What yep. they like. See in here. Yay! Find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. When it comes to protecting shorelines from threats of erosion, storms, and rising seas, the traditional solution has been to build walls or hard infrastructure. But around the U.S., a new alternative is gaining traction. It's called a living shoreline. The story is part of our ongoing series, Peril and Promise, the challenge of climate change, and produced in partnership with Climate Central, a nonprofit science and news organization. On a muggy summer day, almost a dozen workers and volunteers form a bucket brigade. They pass 20 to 30 pound bags of trucked in oyster shells onto waiting rowboats. Then they transport them down the shore, piling the bags strategically in the shallow water next to the marsh. About 200 bags of oyster shells are used to build each 20 foot artificial reef, a form of green infrastructure known as a living shoreline. Rachel Gwynn is the restoration coordinator for the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance, or CBA, a nonprofit environmental organization building this living shoreline at a waterfront home on Florida's Panhandle. So without these reefs, what's happening to this shore? Without these reefs, um, this marsh area is just a really good, healthy salt marsh that would just eventually keep eroding. Traditionally, seawalls built of concrete, wood, or hardened plastic have been used to lock shorelines in place and prevent erosion. A living shoreline is an alternative, which protects the land behind it from erosion by reducing the wave energy. As the waves are knocked down by the artificial reef, sand and other sediment is trapped behind it, rebuilding the shore and allowing vegetation to grow. With the living shorelines, each site's different, you know, especially with the sediment movement, if it's sandy or, or silty, but you could start to build back shoreline and with the marsh grasses growing out, it can help reclaim a bit of your shoreline while stabilizing. And so all this is new? All of it is new in the last two and a half years. On the other side of the bay, homeowner Jennifer McPeak's property has been transformed since the CBA installed the living shoreline. Prior to having this protection, this whole shoreline was scrubbed clean. It was just sand. There wasn't one blade of vegetation on the entire length of the shoreline. And that was making the erosion far worse. So you were watching your land, your backyard disappear. We were watching our biggest investment fall into the ocean. Yes. McPeak and her husband wanted what many of their neighbors had, a seawall. They even started the process of getting a permit from the state's Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP. We had signed on the dotted line. We're putting in a seawall. And uh, the representative from the DEP said, have you ever heard of a living shoreline? And I said, no. She said, well, contact these folks over at the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance um, and ask them about it because I think you guys would be a really good candidate. It took almost a year to get the permits from the state and federal government to build the living shoreline. And it cost about $3,000, about a quarter of what an 80-foot seawall would have. The CBA subsidizes the cost with grants, labor, and oyster shells, which are collected from local restaurants. Are you surprised at how fast it's taken? Shocked. Shocked. We just had to protect the shoreline a little bit to give a chance for these grasses to gain a foothold. And with it, all this life. And that's been the biggest thrill for us. This isn't just grass and some reefs. And this thing is teeming with life. The bags of oyster shells create a whole new habitat. Research shows that living shorelines attract more marine life and plants than seawalls. What kind of things do you see here? Oh my gosh, every kind of crab you can imagine. We've got hermit crabs, uh, 
stone crabs, blue crabs, fiddler crabs, marsh crabs. I sound like that guy from Forrest Gump right now with the <laughs> shrimp, but it's me with the crabs. McPeak's living shoreline is one small example of what's been tried on a larger scale to protect shorelines all around the Gulf. Here in Pensacola, Florida, just like the rest of the southeast or much of the eastern seaboard, coasts have to deal with large storms and hurricanes. But there's a growing body of research that suggests living shorelines like this one are more resilient through storms than hardened shorelines like seawalls. It looks today as good, if not better, than before the hurricane. Daryl Boudreau is the watershed coordinator for the Nature Conservancy. He showed us a 30-acre living shoreline project in downtown Pensacola called Project Green Shores. The first part was completed in 2003, one year before Hurricane Ivan hammered the region. Hurricane Ivan was a Category 3 hurricane. It was basically a direct hit. It washed away the road on I-10 further up the bay. That's how powerful that storm was. But the, the road behind Project Green Shores was really not damaged. The experience with Project Green Shores in Pensacola is not unique. In North Carolina, researchers documented how living shorelines like this one were barely damaged after Hurricane Irene in 2011. While about 100 yards away, this hardened shoreline had to be completely replaced. And then there's sea level rise. Climate change is expected to push seas in this region up between two and five feet over the next 80 years. We've got two different strategies to deal with sea level rise. You've got a solid wall, and you've got this marsh. What's going to do better? I, I would say over time, the marsh is going to do better. The, the sea wall is sort of a fixed point. So it's a fixed height. It's a fixed location. With sea level rise, the water levels are going to increase. And, and the only way to adapt a hardened structure is to come back with a higher structure. Project Green Shores was funded by the federal government, the state, and private sources, including the local utility provider. Another phase of the project is currently being developed using money from the BP oil spill. Boudreaux says it was designed to be an example of what a living shoreline could be. But with more than 14,000 miles of the nation's nearly 100,000 miles of tidal shoreline already hardened with infrastructure like seawalls, living shorelines currently represent a tiny fraction of America's coasts. It takes educating the community because they see a softer solution. And they just say, how does that protect it? But once they have it put in at their neighbor's house and they say, hey, their property's not eroding. And look at the wildlife that it attracts. That's how you get that change and you win people over. So seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. We don't have the research that shows us how to do it all yet. Hugh Sebrian is a marine ecologist with the Dauphin Island Sea Lab and the University of South Alabama. So that's Dauphin Island right there. He took us to a living shoreline project by an uninhabited barrier island off the coast of Alabama. Funded with money from the stimulus plan in 2009, researchers installed bagged oyster shells, but also a commercial product known as Reef Block, a metal triangle filled with oyster shells, and concrete reef balls like these, which are submerged underwater. Seabrian says fish and marine invertebrates love the habitat, but none of the reef designs have completely prevented erosion. The reefs are too far from the shoreline. We are still losing the shoreline very quickly. However, at a nearby site, the state and the federal government funded this project to install these trapezoidal concrete blocks to help rebuild a narrow peninsula damaged by Hurricane Katrina. Since the nearly one mile of artificial reef was installed in 2010, the shore has grown dramatically, creating a vibrant ecosystem. So it's a very healthy environment. We have documented that oysters can settle here. And also a lot of birds will come over to hang out here as well. And also there's a lot of fish that come to these blocks because they find a structure. So all in all, combining marshes with pyramids is a very effective way to create living shorelines. And there's a lot of research behind this. Before these concrete pyramids were deployed in the bay, they were tested here at a wave pool at the nearby University of South Alabama. Engineers tested scale models of the design. Here, they can adjust the size and frequency of the waves to simulate real-world conditions. Brett Webb is a professor of coastal engineering and has consulted on dozens of living shorelines on the Gulf Coast. Testing allowed us to say, number one, that the original size structure would not really work well for that site, that they were going to need to be a little bit bigger. The other thing that allowed us to say is that, hey, we don't need three rows of these structures. We could just have two rows. 
Webb says researchers, including engineers and ecologists, are still figuring out what works and that one size does not fit all. Even with customization, Webb says, living shorelines are not appropriate for all waterfronts. There are also certain cases where somebody just absolutely needs vertical you know, structure along city waterfronts and things like that, where you've got wharfs and marinas or maybe ports and harbors. Going to a natural shoreline there is, is really somewhat counterproductive. But back on the banks of the Choctahatchee Bay in Florida, oyster reef living shorelines like this one have been very effective at protecting land from erosion and building natural habitat. As a final step, the team plants supplementary grass along the shore. Fish is going to get good out of here. Homeowner Butch Richard, a retired Air Force pilot, is optimistic the shore on the far side of his property will start to build back up after years of erosion. Once you get that grass going and going into the water, towards the water, then you're making big progress. The CBA has built more than two miles of living shorelines around the Choctahatchee Bay, and the group says the idea is gaining traction. There's currently a one-year-long waiting list to have an oyster shell living shoreline installed. All right, can you hear me? From learning the physics behind how things work. Yeah. Yep, you can hear me? Yep. Can I can hear you. Yep. All right, so. That was dynamite. Yeah. Do you so want to go back to your presentation, um, your slides? Yeah, can you see me? I can't see your slides. You'll have to share the new sli your slides again. Oh, again, I really apologize, guys. I'm new to this technology. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Okay, so that gave you a primer on, on what a living shoreline is and um, some of the science behind it and some real life applications so that once I start babbling about my living shoreline, you'll have a, a point of reference. So just to give you an idea of where specifically I live, this is an aerial shot of the Destin area. At the bottom of the photo is the Gulf of Mexico. Then you've got the East Pass. You have the um, Destin Harbor to the right, that darker body of water. You see the bridge that going under that bridge leads you actually into the bay. You can see the sandbar that's Crab Island. And then if you hook a hard right and follow the coastline where that big red arrow is, that's where my bayou is. So it's probably, I don't know, a mile and a half as the crow flies out to the Gulf of Mexico. And why this location is pertinent is one, it is a little bit protected um, because we're not directly on the bay. And um, on, on the flip side, where we see a lot of wave energy being generated is actually from the tourists who rent their pontoon boats and their personal watercraft out, you know, uh, from the Destin Harbor. And then they go and cruise around Crab Island and they follow the coast, which is only about a mile from Crab Island, which is nothing on a, on a wave runner. And they'll come into our bayou and they do donuts and there, there are wakes being thrown and um, it does a lot of damage here. So this is what it looked like before we did anything with the shoreline. And as our bayou was, we had some new homes built and they put nice shiny seawalls up. It's a very small bayou. So the wave energy, anytime a boat came through and through a wake, it would bounce off of those hardened structures and it just became like um, sloshing around in a bathtub. So we were literally watching parts of our our property fall off into the water and it was it was horrible it was disheartening and we finally in December 2014 said we have got to stop this we've got to just bite the bullet suck it up put out the money for a seawall and um and start protecting ourselves so another picture you can see how it erodes from underneath and then I would go stand on the edge of my uh, edge of my yard and the ground would crumble under my feet that tree when we first moved here, let's see, this is 2014. So when we first moved here in uh, 2002, that was a living 
pine tree. And over time, we had a bunch of erosion. The roots reached out into that salt water. The tree sucked up the salt water and it killed it. So how did we end up getting a living shoreline? We got talked out of, um, out of doing a uh, seawall. We, have, I've already covered points one and two. Um, we went through the whole bid process for a seawall and a dock. And part of the bid process is the DEP will come in and do a site assessment and they make a determination of where the mean high water line is. And where they put the flags for us would have um, ended up making us cut a big chunk of turf away. And that was not the point. And I got pretty pouty about that. And the DEP rep said, well, you know, you have this op the opportunity to do this thing called a living shoreline and um, contact this woman over at the Chocahatchee Basin Alliance and they can come out and tell you all about it. Well, it was a lot of conversations um, and a lot of anxiety later. And we decided to go with the living shoreline over the seawall. And I would like to say it was purely because we were going to be environmentally conscientious and we were going to be super green about it. But at the end of the day, it was dollars and cents. Um, it was so much cheaper than a seawall. And um, the opportunity to actually achieve some accretion was very uh, attractive to us considering the amount of property we had already lost. Um, and just as a side note, it ended up our, our poor contractor, you know, we had signed on the dotted line and agreed to a price and blah, blah, blah. And our poor contractor is, was extraordinarily patient with the whole process, even knowing that he had the potential to lose a lot of money out of the bargain. Um, but it ended up being a win-win for him because we diverted those funds that we would have paid for an ugly old seawall, which is purely, I mean, seawalls are unattractive. It's purely a functional thing. And we, we diverted the money we would have spent on a seawall into a, uh, a boathouse and a lift. We were just gonna do a basic dock and just tie our boat off to it. But um, we saved so much money by not doing a seawall that we ended up spending that money right back with him um, and getting something that was a lot more useful for us. Okay, so they mentioned the PBS special that it took a year for us to get permitted. Um, we were warned ahead of time, and this is one of the things that caused so much anxiety in the waiting, was we were warned that it, it could be about a six month wait, um, as opposed to 30 days for approval of a seawall. Uh, and one of the reasons for it is that the permitting is federal, it's not local. And I think everybody knows that the federal government moves at the speed of stop. Um, additionally, a, a living shoreline is considered a habitat. It's not a structure. So as part of it, there's this whole review process through National Marine Fisheries um, where they look at endangered species and they wanna make sure that this new habitat that we're introducing into this environment is not going to cause any disruptions. And, you know, spoiler alert, they don't, they don't at all. Um, and at the time the process was being revamped, which meant nobody was doing anything. So in the meantime, because we were pretty panicky about the acceleration of the erosion in the bayou and you know how it is, once you make a decision for a, um, you know, a line of action on something, you want to go ahead and execute. Um, and we had made the decision, we were ready to go. We were ready to save ourselves um, another season of erosion. And to be told, well, you're gonna be doing sort of ethically the right thing, but you're gonna have to wait for a really long time to make it happen. So in the meantime, um, we were turned on to these things called core logs. It's kind of a strange word, C-O-I-R. And what they are is they're coconut fiber and they're wound into these log shapes of varying sizes. They're 100% biodegradable. You don't need permitting. And, um, they'll actually hold the, the shoreline in place while you wait to put in a more permanent structure. Uh, so we ordered a bunch of those and they're pretty cheap actually as well. 
So we ordered a bunch of those and pinned them into place against the shoreline to hold on to everything while we waited for this, um, this permitting process to play out. So those are what core logs, excuse me, core logs look like. We installed those in January of 2015. And I, I worked with the owner of the company um, on how many we should order and how long the, that's untreated pine stakes so that they're not poisoning the waters with, you know, like treated lumber. Um, and she was interested to know on how long, she did not know how long these would work in a saltwater environment. So we pegged them into place. And again, you can see how terrible the erosion was. You, I want you to note that fence line where the bottom of that fence was exposed. Um, there's some more of the shoreline where we pegged them into place. And the water is quite low this time of year in our area, the, the winter tides are quite low. So it was sort of the ideal time to, to put all of these placeholders in. And there's just past the rotted tree. Okay, so a year less one day later, and I called my congressperson, I called my senator. I said, this is ridiculous. You need to talk to those people at NOAA. Um, all of the, the literature produced by NOAA, by the way, said that these uh, living shorelines are much preferable to seawalls, that they're environmentally more responsible, uh, the more environmentally responsible choice, blah, blah, blah. You gotta help me out. Nobody could move anything. So it was a year and a day. And finally we had installation day. And that's just a pile of these bag shells. And they touched on it briefly also in that PBS special. It's pretty cool. The CBA has restaurant tour partners um, all over Destin and um, Santa Rosa Beach and Grayton Beach areas. So when um, tourists and locals go to these seafood restaurants and order oysters, the wait staff will take those emptied oyster shells and throw them in specially designated bins out back. And then CBA drives around with this big trailer and picks them up. And they take them back to their campus um, offices and they spread them out in a parking lot and let the sun and, uh, sun and air dry them and sanitize them over a period of months. And then they bag them up into these marine uh, safe mesh bags and uh, use those as their breakwater. So it's very cool. It keeps all of those oyster shells out of landfills and they get repurposed uh, for these projects. Currently the CBA is um, working with some other material as well, but what I have are these oyster shell, these, they call it recycled oyster shell um, breakwaters. And it's kind of funny because it, Sometimes you'll see a little plastic oyster fork in there or the wrappers from some saltine crackers that got wrapped up in there. And I think, well, I hope somebody enjoyed their meal. So we had truckloads of this and brought them down into, um, into the backyard. And you can see off to the left where that house is being built. Well, somebody put a new seawall in there. So it's still continuing. Seawalls are continuing to, to crop up in my bayou. Um, that's the team. They have kids from AmeriCorps that come and work with them. They have volunteer groups that come and work with them. Um, and they do these bucket brigade lines of these shell bags. And they're quite heavy. It's a, it's a hell of a workout to build some of these reefs. There they are putting them down. There they are. And it's, it's actually, it's a ton of fun. It's, it's very collegial atmosphere. If you ever find yourself in this area and you're looking to do some volunteer work, it'll make you feel good about yourself and, and a good workout, you can go ahead and call CBA up and ask them if they have any build events coming up. And there it is. There's my first one. This was January 2016. There they are. And you can see the core logs held up beautifully. This is a full year later after we put them in. There they are. And there it is. So if you build it, they will come. And I'm talking about critters. Um, what we could, what about the only things we saw prior to putting these, um, these reefs and the grasses in were hermit crabs. It was hermit crab central here. They can live about anywhere. Um, and the occasional blue crab. 
And as soon as we put these reefs in, they provided habitat for all kinds of animals. The crabs, which I went on embarrassingly enough at length about, um, were the, really the first ones to come back and they make their homes among the bags. And then we had um, all kinds of little fish and the grasses and the oyster shell bags provide um, protection for all kinds of juvenile species. They can come in, they can hang out, they have somewhere to hide um, from larger predators. And it, was, it has just been the most extraordinary thing. So on this screen, going from left, and right, left to right, we've got a little fiddler crab running around. Um, you can just see a very well camouflaged goby. Um, got this big burly, um, I think it's a gulf uh, stone crab. We actually have our own little species here. Here uh, to the left, that is a trio of mangrove, juvenile mangrove snappers. Had a little eel living in there. Um, the photo on the right, you can see that dark sort of cylindrical looking shadow. That's actually a juvenile um, floating right above that very well camouflage is a juvenile barracuda. I have, matter of fact, 15 minutes before I came to sit down here, I went out and there was a juvenile barracuda hanging off of some of the reefs waiting to um, pick up a snack. They're so cool, it's amazing. Let's see, we have, that's a little tiny um, uh, stingray, excuse me. Um, he was only about eight inches across and they snuffle along the reefs and eat up the grass shrimp that live there. Um, there's another very well camouflaged fish living among the reefs. That is an oyster toadfish. They're really cool. There's a great big old blue crab there. So everyone loves before and after pictures. So this is just a reminder of how pitiful it was there. December, 2014 on the left, we've got October, 2022 on the right. All of those grasses, we planted the grasses about, um, about six months after we put the reefs in because uh, the CBA actually grows the, the grasses. And what I planted on my shoreline is called smooth cordgrass. Um, it's a native species. It does beautifully here. Um, you can see to the very left of the after photo, it's begun to proliferate across my neighbor's beach. And they're thrilled about it because they've had to replace that sand more times than they can count. Probably, um, probably unpermitted, but I'm not gonna fuss at them about it. Um, but all of that smooth cord grass across these next after pictures that you see were planted in about four by four pots. And it was 10 to 12 plants that I put in, just little four by four pots that the CBA had grown. And the CBA has a really cool program with local schools called Grasses and Classes where they actually have students grow and tend to um, cord grass uh, throughout the year so they can learn a little bit about local ecology. And then the CBA uses them in their restoration efforts. So they've, they've done an extraordinary job of incorporating the community and being just really thrifty and inclusive in um, restoring some of these habitats. Anyway, and I also wanted to point out on the picture to the left of the be or picture, if you look along the fence, that hot pink flag that is furthest to the right, that is where the uh, DEP told us our main high water line was, was. And they were going to have us cut off that entire chunk of land to put the seawall in. So I, we would have lost all of that land, which was decidedly not the point of putting a seawall in. So there's another um, before and what it looks like just last week when I took these photos, quite an improvement. And again, all of those grasses, that's 10 to 12, four by four pots. There's the fence before on the left where it was completely um, eroded underneath it. And this is what it looks like today. Um, that's a six foot fence. And now where I stand, where some of that erosion was, 
I'm five, eight and my, uh, I'm about five inches over the top of that six foot fence. We've put it after storms. I've actually had to rake sand back and redistribute it because so much was built up on the shoreline. I'm kind of a big fan of tropical events now. The two red circled items there were, were where um, those stakes were that we used to put the core logs in place. So again, that's just to give you an idea of how much accretion has happened and now even turf grass has grown over it. Last little item, um, this is a video clip that I shot last week. This is just some sort of average wave action. This is the day-to-day -day stuff. A little bit of a breeze riffling the water. Um, and I want you to look to the left of the screen compared to the other side of the, um, here we go. See all of the movement here. And those breakwaters just absorb that wave energy and there's barely any movement in the water behind it. And that's just a real quick and dirty um, example of how these reefs work to eat up that wave energy as it comes in towards the shore. Oops. So um, natural infrastructure for the wind, just to sum up, we have absolutely not one regret in choosing a living shoreline over a seawall. As homeowners, again, it cannot be overstated, watching our biggest investment fall into the water. We have not had one day where we've said, gosh, I really wish we had done a seawall. Um, I already talked about the ability to divert those funds that would have gone into an ugly and purely utilitarian seawall into a boathouse and a lift, which is a lot more fun than a seawall. Um, we have stopped erosion and additionally, and even better, we've achieved accretion. Um, I've turned into an absolute babbling evangelist about them. I had, it was totally ignorant as what a living shoreline was ahead of time. And now um, I can't stop talking about it. Uh, in concert with the CBA and the National Wildlife Federation, I actually had the opportunity to go up to Washington, D.C. and lobby um, some congressional staff to support various bills that, um, that champion living shorelines over seawalls. And um, I've had the opportunity to lobby reps for our senator and our um, state representatives to make the permitting process easier for homeowners. It seems kind of ridiculous that it is so much more difficult to make the right choice than it is to make the wrong one. Um, a 30 day permitting process versus months and months is just, it's unfair. We're just trying to lobby them to um, make the, the playing field even. Seeing the proliferation of wildlife has been an absolute joy and it's turned this former city girl into a total na nature nerd. And I guess the message is if you just give mother nature a chance, she will knock your socks off. And that's all I got guys. Thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was so awesome. Um, I really love how much of an advocate um, that you've um, become in uh, this very simple way of how it's just kind of touched your life. So I'm super excited. And I hope that all of you all um, enjoy that. Let me see if I can bring my screen back. That's not the one I wanted. Um, sorry, guys, I moved it to the other screen. There it is. Um, all right, wonderful. And can everybody see my screen now? No. No. Let's try oh, again. I can't see it. Let's try escaping. Technology, technology, technology. It wants to know which. Uh, nope. 
There you are. Am I there? Got it. Gotcha. All right. Um, I'm going to go back here. Everybody still see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all. All right. Um, so I kind of wanted to um, highlight, let me see if I can go to full screen. There we go. A little bit better. All right. Um, thank you again so much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. I loved all the pictures. Um, I always love that, you know, I say pictures um, speak a thousand words. So um, that was really fantastic that you took the time to uh, do those before and after pictures to really show us how it looks now. Um, and this is, you know, a really wonderful opportunity for many homeowners, um, as well as parks and things. Uh, I'll give a little plug again for CBA just did a living shoreline uh, in an area called Live Oak, which is on the Choctahatchee Bay. It's on the southern part of the bay. Um, in Walton County, uh, and they did about a mile of living shoreline there. And this area was um, in particular having really serious erosion issues. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think they were losing like, you know, seven feet a year kind of a thing um, from the amount of wave action. I like to give the example that living shorelines, if you're in the beach um, and, or if you're in the, in the, in the ocean um, and you're standing, facing the ocean and the wave hits you, it hits really hard. But if you turn sideways, it's a little bit less, um, you know, of, uh, of an impact to you. And, and that's really what these living shorelines do. All right, Tony, are you ready to um, join in? Yes. Just a little update. And I just wanted to add, uh, Jennifer, that was incredible. Uh, it just goes to show you what, uh, what uh, individuals can do and with the help of the uh, organizations like CBA, it's uh, it's absolutely incredible what can be done. Good, uh, job. Good job. Thank you. So and it's really uh, important um, for you guys as citizens, um, because you know, you're you're learning about this technology or this opportunity, this opportunities. And, and uh, just like Jennifer said, she's not had a chance to, uh, you know, didn't know anything about it before and, and you know, became available and, and became a strong advocate. So as citizens, that's that that's the kind of stuff that uh, will really make a difference in um, in improving our bay and and protecting it and um, you know doing what we can to uh, to prevent the erosion. Um, so I just had you know um, I'm going to skip over some of these slides a little bit. Um, just give you a little progress report about us and how we've kind of grown along. Um, and then you know you see this in the December the end of December 2023. That is uh, the current goal for, um, or expected for the um, completion of our comprehensive conservation management plan. So I just yeah. kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of a timeline of how, um, how we've progressed. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Tony. Great. So, um, and uh, thank you, Sabina. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with uh, the CAC today. Um, the team that uh, is working on your CCMP development uh, includes uh, my firm here. Uh, and uh, uh, joining us is uh, uh, Lynn Cherry from Carpe Diem. Many of you may know Lynn. She's been working in that area for a long, long time and, and helping uh, put together uh, projects like this. Uh, that, and uh, very important that we have uh, Lynn and she's on the, on, uh, the call today. Uh, and also uh, Environmental Science Associates, Eric Schneider uh, in particular is working with us on the development of the CCMP. And for those that, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. The, um, I don't see the slides moving. No, they're not moving on. Uh -uh. Muted. All right. You cannot see the slide. We can see it, but they, they're not moving. Go to the next it, one. We're still good. on the cover slide. All right. Let me try stopping my share again and let's try it again. Yeah. Sometimes that's the thing you got to do is uh, kind of reset it. But while you're while you're doing that, um, 
The, the uh, of course, we've been working with the Tech Food Advisory Committee as well as the CAC. Um, and for those that are not totally familiar with what a comprehensive conservation plan is, it, it, it's a very collaborative effort on the part of stakeholders that look are looking to restore, protect uh, cr critical water bodies, and, and in particular, uh, in this situation, uh, Choctahatchee Bay and uh, those waters that drain into the bay. Again, it's a very collaborative process uh, where uh, the, the uh, entities involved in the process uh, share information regarding um, the status and, and trends of this uh, situation and these water bodies just concerned uh, what the, you know, the focus areas that uh, need to be addressed in terms of putting together a plan like this. But one of the really critical things is to recognize that uh, a CCMP is not a typical uh, plan that many of you have seen that too often end up on somebody's um, um, bookshelf. Um, what's important at, at the end of, and, and um, Sabina mentioning that uh, at the end of 2023, at that point, uh, uh, there is going to be a, a, a final document that goes to the major stakeholders in the process who will enter into an interlocal agreement, uh, agreeing upon uh, uh, that uh, interlocal agreement on how you're going to contribute to achieving the goals of the CCMP. So it's a very, very important step in the process. But in, in uh, the next slide, please. So um, we've been working with, uh, uh, with, with both groups. Um, we, last September, we uh, submitted a series of, of chapters on the, some of the initial chapters on that CCMP, including a uh, description of the area, you know, what is a CCMP, uh, who makes up the management conference. Um, and then most importantly is uh, over, Years before we, we were actually involved, uh, there was a great deal of work that was done uh, by the Tech Advisory Committee and others and identifying these focus area goals and objectives. Uh, they, they evolved over time and, and what we've uh, been able to incorporate um, in, in, these, in this chapter in particular, uh, the results of a workshop that was held back in July of 2021. So again, we're trying to stand on the shoulders of the work that was done previously uh, in, the, in this process. And then an, an important uh, a part of um, ICCMP, especially for those that will be looking at this, you know, from other areas, uh, and that is a, a characterization of the, of the bay itself and, and the watershed that drains to it, and which is a really interesting process in and of itself because of the fact that a major part of the watershed actually uh, extends up into Alabama. So there are a lot of collaborators and contributors to the information that we've used in developing this technical characterization. We'd like to thank those that have provided that information. Um, we've asked uh, for reviews to be uh, completed. And, and you know, as, as uh, I, like I mentioned last week in another meeting, you know, I recognize that everyone has, you know, their day jobs. And so we're asking for a little bit uh, uh, a, 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 um, some consideration on your part to try try to get to us uh, comments and questions that you may have on those chapters. Uh, that's the only way we're going to be able to improve on them and refine them. Um, and so we were looking to that, and we uh, we've asked that uh, that try to get us those comments by the end of October. Um, you know, if if we get one on November second, it doesn't mean they're not going to look at it, but. Uh, um, as best you can uh, provide us comments on those chapters. As Sabina said, um, the email that went out referred to as Dropbox. If you're not familiar with the Dropbox and use things like SharePoint, we also have all the documents available on SharePoint. Uh, and Sabina also offered to, uh, to be a conduit, uh, if, if, but as these uh, files get larger and larger, it's a little more difficult uh, to do a typical email, but... Uh, uh, all those in all those chapters again are out there and we're looking for uh, your thoughts and, and uh, your consideration of that information. So the next slide. Um, and and uh, importantly is that um, you know what again we're planning because the, the 
the grant that supports the CCMP development um, comes to an end in April of 2024. And the intent is to have, um, a, 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 to achieve a, a, a CCMP plan that can be considered as part of an interlocal agreement uh, sometime in 2024. So we're shooting for uh, having that final document by the end of December of next year. Um, and, and importantly, the next two pieces that we are going to be working on are a monitoring plan, uh, which are, is specific to identifying the monitoring that's ongoing, that can address those focus areas that I spoke to. Um, and uh, importantly is uh, identifying any gaps in monitoring that may be uh, uh, considered for uh, included in, in the CCMP monitoring plan. Uh, and the bulk of the CCMP, as always, is are these action plans. And action plans are comprised of uh, various projects that, again, address those, in, uh, in particular, six focus areas. Uh, so again, uh, looking for input from the, uh, share, the uh, stakeholders, uh, that are going to share in this process of identifying projects. Um, projects can basically fall into like three baskets. Um, Want to make sure that you know people have been doing things like, like this living shoreline project, for example. Um, we want to make sure that some of the, the projects that have been recently completed are are uh, are given appropriate credit. So one basket over some recently completed projects. Another basket um, uh, are going to be projects that are already underway, maybe not yet completed, uh, but uh, those that, that uh, have already, uh, again, uh, been initiated. Uh, important in that uh, reporting of those projects is, um, you know, and, and all the projects, uh, you know, who, who's responsible for in, implementing the project, who are the partners that, that may be involved with it. Um, but in the second basket, what's going to be important is identifying uh, when, when might these projects be completed. And the third basket of projects are those that are, have not yet been completed, but uh, are, are maybe part of your existing CIPs your, uh, and, uh, or other projects that may be emerge as we move forward in, in this uh, CCMP development. So again, we want to make sure that uh, each of these is uh, uh, well, well represented and uh, included in our CCMP document, in your CCMP document. So any uh, comments or questions? Are you gonna go into any of the feedback that's already been provided in, uh, to the initial drafts? No, yes, and I do wanna thank folks that have already provided that. Uh, one of, one of the, uh, in, in a couple of different ways that we're going to do that, uh, one is that, uh, and one of the chapters of the CCMP in particular asks for what kinds of comments and specifically have been ob obtained um, uh, and provided by um, the CAC in particular and how we responded to those. So that, those will be formalized uh, in, in that CCMP chapter in particular. Uh, but also, you'll um, uh, we'll, we'll be able to in providing the final draft of uh, these chapters. We'll make mention of, of those uh, uh, questions and comments, and um, we can also make available to everybody the comments that we have received, um, and um, we can we can provide a process by which you can obtain those. I think that would be a good idea because it would be good to see what fellow CAC members are saying and uh, and just the sharing of ideas, I think would be very healthy. Exactly, exactly. And the same thing with the, uh, for, you know, the same for the TAC as well. So um, uh, Sabina, uh, this um, is, um, a, a, uh, so anyways, I, I wanted to, to uh, Again, thank folks that have provided input uh, already to uh, to us, and we're looking for uh, you know continued input uh, uh, so that we we can again make this a a a, a, a very good product. Um, down below, you see here uh, there's some CCMPs that we've actually worked on, 
and contributed to in Florida. Um, the, 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 in this process, you know, for me over the years is, has been um, the, 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 the really how important it is to, to work together uh, in this collaborative fashion. Um, and, and here's a good example, you know, Jennifer was trying to, you know, to uh, get a response from a regulatory agency. And, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult for individuals to get a response. And she's a good, good example of that. But when you go as a, a, a group, um, and in this case, let's say the stakeholders of the Choctahatchee Bay um, uh, CCMP development, when, when, when you make a call, it's more likely to be responded to by those regulatory agencies. So there's a, there's a very much a, a benefit, uh, you know, to, to being able to work together um, in addressing these things. And the other thing is, and a good point that was just made is that, you know, you, you learn more at, by, by working together. Um, and and uh, it, it certainly uh, brings, to, uh, brings to bear how important um, Choctahatchee Bay is to um, those that, of you that, that uh, you know, take it to heart. Uh, it, it really is important. Um, Brian mentioned yesterday the, uh, uh, an evaluation of the economic benefit of, um, uh, you know, Choctahatchee Bay. One was just done not too recent, not too long ago by uh, uh, Tampa Bay. And one of the things that they found, this was really interesting, is that one in one of every six jobs in the Tampa Bay watershed um, were not just due to the fact that Tampa Bay was there, but that Tampa Bay water quality was good. It, you know, it, it you know, so it, it's not just a property value of sitting on a water body, but because if that water body is impaired, um, you know, for whatever reason it may be, uh, it's really not an economic benefit, but. Uh, here's a case of one of every six jobs in a watershed, depending upon good water quality. It's, it, that was a very important finding, uh, pretty interesting. And I'm sure that's the case for all estuaries, that it's not just the fact that the water is there, but the water is, um, is what you'd like it to be. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. Did you want to share um, anything else? I uh, no, I'm good. I'm good here. If there's any other questions, any other questions for Tony? Um, so I just have one more, and um, again, uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out the right right right, right way to ask this. So, uh, it, it's my assumption that the CCMP is going to have some very specific measurements and goals. And it's going to have very specific activities that's going to um, need to be com uh, completed in order, we believe, based on science, to achieve these goals. You said it better than I can in many respects. I would, no, that's exactly the case. I mean, so, so some of these activities, um, folks are going to be at odds with. You know, whether on one side you might have uh, folks with a very strong environmental perspective, on the other side you may have folks with, you know, that have commercial livelihoods and things like that, that may be at risk by what are being advocated. Um, when you say the CCMP is going to be complete and ready to present to the board by December of 2023, is that going to be uh, a product by which all that hashing out, give and take, horse trading, call it what you want, will have already taken place and we will be presenting to the board, here is what we, through this collaborative process, have sat down and through a lot of discussion is what we, all the entities involved, are willing to sign up for or is what's going to be presented to the board in December of 2023 uh, be basically, hey, here are the targets. Here's what we would like to do. Here's what we think are the measures that we need to implement. Uh, now, 
you know, the, the horse trading or negotiation or coming up with consensus and that everybody can buy off on with some sort of smile begins. The, the, the uh, well, it, and, and, you know, every one of these is different, uh, but, but one of the things that I've learned is that, and, and we've seen this in practice, is that, um, it, it, interestingly enough, uh, I mean, I, we, we've worked on things like this where uh, people that you might think would, might be on the other side of the table, if you will, have really come to and participated in the process. Um, this included things like uh, industrial uh, uh, um, entities, uh, for example, you know, electric power utilities have joined in this process of developing CCMPs. Uh, in some cases, we've had agricultural interests that have also uh, contributed, you know, to the process of, uh, you know, developing a CCMP. So. Um, if anything, in many, in many respects, I think it, it fostered uh, that kind of interaction with, uh, with the environmental groups and the regulatory agencies, you know, which make up the community. So, um, what you know, what 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 we will be able to help you with is to achieve. I, I'm hoping is that um, when when the time comes for consideration on the part of the of the Policymakers and decision makers that um, will will have we will have attempted to come to grips with some of those people that that you feel may be at odds uh, with 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 the process, uh, but but you know practice has shown is that they they, um, they see the benefit of being part of that, uh, especially when you when you consider how the CCMP is going to um evolved in a regulatory process as well okay so i see a few comments in the chat let me see if i've missed anybody um show chat previews it does not show me the chat previews all right um excellent were there any other questions um about the ccmp or tony All right, I don't see anybody jumping in. So I'm just gonna back up to this one slide and highlight what Tony was saying earlier. This is um, some screenshots of some of the economic value to um, the estuary. And um, this was done in 2006. We are um, anticipating uh, being able to do a new economic uh, update of this, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the economic impact to our um, area, specifically in relation to the Choctaw Bay and the jobs created. I'm sure this will be, uh, you know, this was done in 2006. So we're hoping that we'll be doing uh, another one to update the numbers um, and we'll certainly share those with each of you. But I put that slide in there uh, with the intention of sort of sharing what, uh, what it means, uh, you know, in dollars and cents. So thank you very much, Tony, for um, popping in and sharing that information. Um, and like I said, it's really important for us to have that um, feedback from you guys. If you happen to have um, uh, friends or um, associates that would like to uh, review this, you know, maybe you know some fishermen or maybe you know some um, you know, realtors or other businesses or people or anyone that would uh, be willing to um, uh, review uh, the draft documents that we have out right now would be wonderful. Please let me know by email. I'll be happy to share it. Our um, our hope is is that in the um, near future that we'll be um, or not so distant future we'll be getting a website up and we might be able to make it uh, a lot more easier to share some of these documents through our website as a link uh, so that the size of it and things will be a little bit better. But we're still kind of working out some of the kinks of the best way to share that, but it's really critical that we get um, as many people uh, to review it and look at it and, and give us our feedback. You know, is it a document that, um, you know, that is readable, that's understandable, as well as um, giving us, uh, you know, some clear points. I also added in here um, what our focus areas are. These are the six focus areas of the CCMP. 
And then we have, um, you know, the goals and objectives um, on top of that uh, that are intended. So in the CCMP, these are, like I said, the, the focus areas. And then underneath these focus areas are goals and objectives that will, you know, be spelled out in the CCMP. And then uh, over time, um, we'll be utilizing, you know, those, those types of things to be able to um, act upon what we've put together. So um, I think that it's really important that um, everyone that has an opportunity be able to get involved and, uh, you know, review some of the documents to make sure that, you know, that we're, we're putting it all together. So thank you so much, Tony, for joining in. Uh, this was uh, just some examples of how, um, you know, we talked about the living shorelines and, and uh, some images. So I just kind of wanted to share that as well. Um, so the other pieces that we were going to, I'm going to go back to our agenda. Uh, we were going to talk about was some trash cleanups. Um, I, I look to you um, as our citizens to, you know, sort of give me feedback. Uh, I've got uh, the plan for some cleanup, trash cleanup events that I'd like to hold. With the weather turning colder, it's making it a little bit, um, a little bit more challenging. I'm hoping that we'll get some warm weather again. But uh, I wanted to get your feedback on uh, and opinions on doing some cleanup events on the bay. There aren't a lot of events that go on. There are some private, you know, sort of clubs and things like that that do some cleanups, but they're um, really more unique to specific clubs. So I'd like to do a lot more uh, reach out, outreach and, and, you know, putting these maybe on Eventbrite um, to reaching out and doing some cleanups along the bay within Okaloosa and Walton County. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, for those of you that are on the water, are there areas that uh, you specifically know about um, that, you know, you see a lot of trash at maybe some boat launches uh, or, you know, do you think that, um, you know, there's some other avenues that I can advertise them in. So I really hope that you'll be able to uh, sort of be my eyes and ears on the bay uh, and give me some feedback on that. I don't wanna to go too, too late since we've, um, you know, uh, taken uh, about a little over an hour now in our meeting. And I um, would like to, um, you know, just kind of hit the highlights at this point and go ahead and end our meeting if that's all right with everybody. If you have some specific areas on those, um, you know, areas of either Okaloosa County or Walton County that uh, you would like uh, to bring to my attention or maybe have some, you know, maybe you saw a really great um, way that, um, you know, that events were promoted uh, or websites or things like that, and you'd like to share those with me, please do so. Um, Y'all have my email and it's at the end of uh, the presentation as well. So I'll pop that back up on the screen in a minute. And um, the other thing that's really going to be um, wonderful that I hope that y'all join us next month is that we have a photo contest uh, going on. And I would love for the citizens to um, advisory count, um, committee or, or CAT group to uh, you know, decide on the first, second, and third place uh, winners. Uh, I've got some donated uh, gift cards uh, for, to local area restaurants that will be our prizes um, for our uh, photo contest. And um, you know, I'll be putting them on, the, on our Facebook page. So um, I really hope that you'll join us in December for that. And details, more details will be coming out about that. I'm going to, if it's all right with everybody, talk about rain barrels and rain gardens um, in our next meeting so that we can save a little bit of time. And then just highlight um, that our future meetings are done virtually via Zoom. Um, not opposed to doing some in-person meetings um, in the future. So if you feel that that would be uh, something that you'd like to see, um, by all means, just let me know either in the chat or by email. Uh, our future meetings at this point are December 8th, and that's when we'll be doing the photo contest winners. And then uh, the one after that will be February 23rd of next year. Hard to believe that it's going to be 2023. And April 27th, I thought I'd give you sort of a, you know, heads up of the next three meetings so that you can kind of pencil those into your calendars. And of course, I um, send out the save the dates um, for those um, meetings as well to, you know, pop up into your calendar. Um, I am having trouble with uh, getting the comments to post. Uh, Brian, would you able, be able to see them? I can't seem to get the, the, the Zoom to let me do it. Uh, yes, we uh, have a few chat comments and um, 
Mary Gutierrez had to pop off to join another meeting. Okay. Um, see, see, uh, John Yost indicated that the Choctatchee Basin Alliance has completed a living shoreline at the Eden Gardens uh, State Park over in Point, Washington. Um, Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, John. I did not know that. So that's pr pretty much it. Okay. Fantastic. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any comments? Anything? You know, this is this is as much um, you know uh, our your committee as it is mine. Uh, so I'm facilitating this to um, to get that outreach to everybody. And you know, if you have, um, please talk up our group. Talk up um, you know the Chalkatchee Bay Estuary Program. Uh, share with your neighbors and your friends, and uh, let me know if there are people that you would um, that would like to be interested in joining our group. Uh, you know, we really uh, welcome anyone uh, to come in. And for those of you uh, that did not know, on our YouTube channel, I post these videos so that um, you know other people can uh, see them, and then people that aren't able to make the meeting are able to review them afterwards. So, um, you know, that's also a, a great way that. If someone is that you're interested, uh, that might be interested in, in um, being a part, they'd be able to look at some of those videos in the past and review them and, and uh, get kind of a sense of where we're at and what we are. Um, so yeah. this is how to contact me, Sabina Pennington at myogalusa.com. The website is not up. It's um, uh, coming soon at this point um, and still in the development stages. So hang tight with that, but um, just kind of wanted to give you a little heads up on that as well. So Bina, this is Debbie before you um, before you close out. Um, I don't have any questions or anything, but I just wanted to um, to um, tell you, thank you so much for um, the invitation for me to join um, in on your meeting today. I really, really enjoyed the presentation. I mean, very amazing. Um, I picked up information that I never could have imagined. Um, I'm not the, the greatest when it comes to, you know, the, the waterways and those type things. You know, I just lean to depend on my social work experience, but um, I, I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much again for um, inviting me to uh, be a part of your meeting today. It's great. It's wonderful to have you, Debbie. Thank you. Thank Sabina. you very much. I appreciate that feedback. Sabina? And if there's some specific topics that you guys would like to have, um, you know, discussed uh, or areas that you'd like more information about, I'd be more than happy to share those in the meetings as well. So um, my line is always open, uh, whether it's by email or by phone. So please don't hesitate. So are there any last minute uh, comments or questions that anybody would like to share? All right, going once, going twice. Um, Thank you, so I, Sorry? Thank you. Thank you. So I suggest that we can go ahead and end our meeting if uh, everyone is in agreement, um, or I guess I should say if anyone's in disagreement and you'd like to cover something else, by all means. Um, but I thank you all so much for giving of your time today and joining our meeting. And I look forward to seeing you all on December 8th. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Again, thanks so much, Jennifer and Tony, for popping in and presenting tonight, today. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.